What would you say is, is the most popular, well-known verse in all the Bible? Now, the most popular chapter or psalm would be the 23rd Psalm. Everybody would say that. But, but what is the most popular verse? And usually if, one pers- if a person knows one verse of Scripture, they know this verse. What is it? <laughs> I knew you'd say it. John 3.16. John 3.16, that's the most popular verse in all the Bible because it's a concise definition and description of what it means to be a Christian and how to give your life to Christ. That one verse presents the plan of salvation. But here's the question. Do you know the context of it? You know why that verse happened and you know who was speaking to who in the midst of that verse. We know John 3.16, but a lot of times we don't know what happened to bring about that great verse of John 3.16. So this summer, over the next few weeks, we're going to be focusing on John 3. John 3. We're going to be talking about this particular context and the man who comes to see Jesus and the answers that Jesus gives. And I truly believe that if you come, you're going to reap some spiritual nuggets that's going to bless your heart. It's going to bless your life. Because we're going to be talking about some things that maybe you've had questions about before. For instance, those things about where he says, you must be born again. Why does Jesus say and what does he mean when he says, you must be born again? We're going to answer some questions about death. You hear death used in the Bible and there's the first death and the second death. And what is he talking about and what are those deaths? And how does Jesus coming keep us from experiencing death? What does that mean? Or when it says that that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Or in the same chapter, it's going to say, and if the Son of Man be lifted up. When the Son of Man is lifted up like the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness. What does that mean? Or when he makes a statement that says that he who has not believed has been judged already. He who has not believed has been judged already. We're going to be dealing with these verses and these passages, so I encourage you to be a part as much as you can. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn to John chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse number 1, and we're going to let this establish that setting to help us to understand who this is that comes to see Jesus. His name is Nicodemus. It tells us about him and the experience that Nicodemus has with Jesus. Look at what it says in verses 1 through 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do Unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Who is it that comes to see Jesus? It's a man named Nicodemus. And it tells us a number of things about this man named Nicodemus. First of all, it tells us that he was a teacher. Not only a teacher, but when Jesus refers to him later down in the passage in verse, 29, uh, verse 9, he says, Are you the teacher of Israel? Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? In other words, Nicodemus was not just a teacher. He was considered to be a respected teacher. To the point that the definite article is used and says that you are the teacher Jesus says that you're one of the ones who are taking the Scripture and leading people to understand what the Scripture means. And you're the one who takes that old, those Old Testament passages and supposed to be revealing what those truths are. And some of those passages are specifically about a coming Messiah and one who is going to be a Redeemer and one who is going to set all men free and to make the world as it ought to be. He says, you are the teacher. So here is Nicodemus, who's a teacher of the Jews. Not only is he a teacher, though, it says he is a Pharisee. Now, you've heard that term probably all your life because you know that whenever Jesus had to combat people, many times the ones he was combating were the Pharisees and the 
Sadducees, that's right. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were, were a religious party or a religious group that were established uh, during that intertestamental time. Intertestamental time is 400 years when there really wasn't a word from God, a prophet of God that spoke. In those 400 years, there was a dividing up of the people and the religious leaders, and there became three particular groups that were established, and the Pharisees were one of those. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, or Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. Those were the three groups who were the religious leaders of the Jews. Now, if you were to think about those, the Pharisees, they were the formalists. They were the ones who were the traditionalists. They were the ones who, you know, this is what we're supposed to do, and this is how we're supposed to be about it. They were more considered the Puritan type, or no, the legalistic type in regard to it in their lives. The Sadducees, they were the free thinkers. They didn't really like abiding by the laws and the, the rules, and they liked to have different interpretations and different ideas. And the Essenes were really, truly the Puritans. They were ones who had a heart towards God, and they weren't so much taught up in, caught up in tradition as they were just trying to find God in the midst of those things. But the Pharisees, they were the ones who were the formalists and the traditionalists. Well, here was the problem. Whenever they took the Bible, they would turn around and they would make notes in the margin of their Scripture. The Old Testament, here's the law. And they'd make notes about that and make comments about that of what those things meant. Those became the traditions those became the traditions of men. Here was the problem. They got more caught up in the traditions than they did the Word of God. They were more passionate about the notes they had taken and written than they were about what God's law said. That's kind of like uh, taking a commentary and letting the commentary be the Bible. Commentaries are not Bibles. They are opinions of people about what the Bible says. If you're going to study the Bible, always study the Bible. Nothing wrong with reading commentaries. Just remember that those are the comments that are made about the passage. Never let that be a substitute for the passage. Well, that's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees got so caught up. They, they looked at all those traditions and they followed those traditions and they made those laws that they were by, the Sabbath laws and everything else. And they were passionate about that. That's why Jesus battled them so much. Jesus said, you've neglected the law. You, you, you've left God's word out, but you're so passionate about the traditions. You're not to be passionate about traditions, you're to be passionate about the word of God. Well, he was a, group, he was a part of that group of the Pharisees. Not only were they the traditionalists and the formalists who were keeping those laws, they also had become a powerful political party. At the time of Jesus, in the time of the Herods, the King Herods, the Pharisees had grown to a group of about 6,000 people. 6,000 people who were the Pharisees. And they had begun to be a very powerful force, political force, in the midst of the running of the Jewish state and of their influence towards Rome. Here are those Pharisees who were 6,000 strong. So here's Nicodemus, who's a teacher. Supposed to know the word, a Pharisee who knows all the traditions and everything and very religious in what he does. And hold on a second, it says something else about him. It says he was also a ruler, a ruler of the Jews. Now, what did that mean? That meant he was a part of the Sanhedrin. You ever heard of the Sanhedrin? That's the ruling class or the ruling council of the Jews. It was made up of 70 men. Seventy men, and that goes back to the tradition of, of Moses. You remember when, when God told Moses to call out 70 men who would help him lead? The elders who would help him lead? Well, that tradition continued on, and that's where the Sanhedrin came, and there were 70 of them. Actually, 71, because the high priest was the president of the Sanhedrin, and he was there in that preeminent state, and then 70 other elders. This man, Nicodemus, was one of those rulers. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. One of those 71 who were the ruling class, made the religious decisions for the Jewish faith, also civil leaders in regard to the Roman government, he was a ruler. What I'm simply trying to share with you is this. 
Nicodemus was the best that the nation had to offer. He was the best that the Jewish nation had to offer. He was considered a prominent teacher. He was considered a religious man who was a Pharisee. And he was also a member of the ruling class, the Sanhedrin. He was the best that could be offered by the Jewish nation. The best that could be offered. But you know what? There was something missing in his life. You need to write that down. There was something missing in his life. I'll tell you something. You can be the best our nation has to offer. <laughs> you can be the best, supposedly, that mankind has to offer. But you may realize and understand that there's a need in your life. Because all that man has to offer and all the prominent positions you might have in life will never fill the void that is in your spirit and in your heart. That void that is there because you're missing out on the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was a religious man, but he was missing out on something very, very important. Something that he needed in his life. And therefore, Nicodemus was influenced by and he was wooed by the Holy Spirit. Do you hear that? The Holy Spirit draws people. And the Holy Spirit was working on Nicodemus, who was the best that the Jews had to offer. The Holy Spirit was working on Nicodemus. Do you know how he was working on him to the point that he came to Jesus eventually? We have to back up a few verses up in uh, chapter 2. And you find out that Jesus has, uh, is doing all kinds of signs. Verse 23. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. Observing signs and miracles that he was doing. Well, do you know who one of the people was that was in that crowd that was watching those signs and those miracles? His name was Nicodemus. You know why? Because in a minute when he talks to Jesus, he's going to say, We know that you're from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless they be from God. So the Holy Spirit had drawn Nicodemus to come and to see what Jesus was doing. To be in the midst of that crowd. Now think about this. He is one of 6,000 Pharisees. He's a prominent teacher. And he's one of 71 people who are the ruling class. And he is there in the midst of that crowd. Made up mostly of common people who have needs. And he is drawn to that place to look and to watch and to see what Jesus is doing. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit drew him. The Holy Spirit drew him when many of the 6,000 Pharisees, they weren't drawn. And many of the Sanhedrin, those 70 weren't, weren't, weren't drawn. Now, it doesn't mean all of them weren't drawn. Because remember, Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin as well. And he's the one that allowed him to bury Jesus in his tomb. He was a believer. And, and Gamaliel, who was a very religious and wise man who gave great counsel to Paul, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And even Paul was a member of that. So in other words, there were some righteous people in the midst of it. But out of those 71 people, most of them didn't come and watch what Jesus did. Most of them weren't observing the miracles that Jesus did, the signs that Jesus did. The Pharisees were more afraid of him than they were watching what he was doing. But here's Nicodemus who comes and watches and sees those signs and those miracles. And the Holy Spirit is working on him and pulling him. Pulls him to the point that it says here that Nicodemus, in verse number 2, that this man came to Jesus by night. He not only saw what Jesus was doing, but he came to see Jesus. Now, it says he came by night. What does that mean? Well, most people attribute the fact that he came because at night because he was afraid. He was afraid that some of the Pharisees or some of the Sanhedrin would see and they would criticize him. I don't think that was it at all. The reason he came at night was because traditionally that was the time that you visited with somebody. 
at nighttime. That was the time when there would be the gathering and the fellowship time. I, I guess we do that in our culture, but we don't do that in cult, our culture near as much as all the other cultures. For instance, when I was in Argentina on a mission trip, and we were down there, you stayed busy all day long, and then you ate supper about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I mean, you're eating supper at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, and you know what? Then that's when they came to visit. They showed up at your house about 10 o'clock. They came to see the North American. I was a novelty. One time in my life, I've been a novelty. I was a novelty, came to see the North American, and they visited from about 10 to 12. That was the time that they visited. In the Jewish culture, they visited at night. They worked during the day, but whenever darkness came, that's whenever they would gather and they would talk. So it would be a traditional time for him to come at night. A third reason is this, not just out of, uh, because of the fear factor or because of the fact of coming there because it's normal. The third thing is he wanted to have uninterrupted time with Jesus. He needed some uninterrupted time with Jesus where he could have a chance to talk to Jesus about some very important things that were on his heart. See, all during the day, there was the constant crowd, the ever-present crowd that was distracting and pulling and needing and asking. And there was no way for Nicodemus to be able to sit and ask Jesus about some vital questions that were piercing his heart and things he wanted to know about him. So he went there at night. The Holy Spirit drew him listen and he made a decision a very important decision a decision that says I'm going to go I'm going to talk to Jesus I'm going to go I'm going to talk to Jesus yes I'm a teacher (laughs) Uh, yes I'm a Pharisee yes I'm a member of the Sanity but I am going to go And I'm going to talk to Jesus. Write down in your notes, if you're taking notes, that's an important decision for everybody. That's an important decision for everybody. When the Holy Spirit woos you, when the Holy Spirit is moving on you unto salvation or unto some other decision that you've got to make or something He's trying to do in your life, when the Holy Spirit draws you and you sense that drawing in your life, the best thing to do is make arrangements to have undistracted, uninterrupted time and go talk to Jesus, okay? Go talk to Jesus. And here's the great thing about Jesus. He's always available to you. And he's always ready to talk to you. The fact that you need that uninterrupted, undistracted time is not because Jesus is too busy. It's because you're too busy. And the best answer you'll ever find whenever you're trying to search and find and know what you're supposed to do, the best place you'll ever find and the best counsel that you'll ever receive is from Jesus. Just go talk to Jesus. And that's what Nicodemus did. And listen, when Nicodemus does this, this is going to open up his world. This is going to open up this man's world to things he never thought, that he never imagined. Because he goes to talk to Jesus. Now, listen to what he says to Jesus whenever he gets there. The man came to Jesus by night and he said this. Rabbi, circle that word, rabbi. We know that you have come from God as a, circle this word, as a Teacher, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. His first thing is he calls him a rabbi and a teacher. Now, that was very polite and very respectful of Jesus. You've got to understand, here is Jesus who's a young man. In regard to his prophetic ministry, in regard to his teaching, he's a young man. Because do you realize, think about this, in the Jewish culture, until you got to the age of 30... You couldn't really serve as a prophet or a priest because they didn't think you were mature enough. (laughs) You had to be at least 30 before you could ever hold those positions to be mature enough. And and so Jesus, he just started his ministry at the age of 30. That's why he started at 30. And he's only going to preach to 33. And then he's going to go back to his father after he's been crucified. So he's early in his ministry and he's a young man. Probably Nicodemus was twice his age. But when Nicodemus comes to him, he calls him a rabbi and a teacher. He is showing great respect for this young man. He's showing great respect for a man who is from Nazareth. He's showing great respect from a man who is not a part of the priestly tribe. Either the tribe of Judah, the ruling tribe, not the priestly tribe. 
Most of the teachers would have come out of the priestly tribe. The Pharisees out of the priestly tribe. He's showing great respect. He is not being condescending. You know, a lot of times when people came to Jesus, they'd say, hey, teacher. And then they really were trying to trap him. That was not the heart of Nicodemus. He was serious when he comes to Jesus. And he was respectful when he's coming to Jesus. And there's a longing in his heart to find out something. To find out who this man is and why this man has come. Because he knows that he is not just a man He's not just a man, not just an ordinary man. He says, you're a man who has come. Listen, you are a man who has come from God. These signs and these miracles that I've seen with my eyes and you've done before the crowd, these signs and miracles cannot be done by an ordinary man. This week in Vacation Bible School, one of the lessons that we taught is he's more than just a good man. Matter of fact, one of the songs they sung, he is more than just a good man. Jesus is truly more than just a good man. And Nicodemus said, I know that you have come from God. I know that you are a teacher. I know that you're a rabbi who has come from God. Great respect and honor that he pays to Jesus. But in those words, he also reveals something. That he does not have a sufficient understanding of who Jesus truly is. Because of what he says. Listen, go back to that verse again. Verse 2. It says... We know that you have come from God, here it is, as a teacher. Now, here's the truth about Jesus. Jesus is the greatest teacher there's ever been. He is the greatest teacher. He's teacher with a capital T, all right? There's none like him. But God did not send him here as a teacher God did not send him here only to be a teacher. God did not send him here to expound the truths of the law, even though he does all of that. There's a far different reason that Jesus has come. So Nicodemus, even though he's respectful of Jesus, and he recognizes there's a uniqueness about Jesus, he does not comprehend and have any idea who this man is that he's talking to. All he sees him is in the sense of being a teacher, a rabbi, who is good at what he does and who obviously sent from God because the power of God and the signs of God and the miracles of God are being performed by him. But he doesn't understand who he is. That's why Jesus says what he says in verse number 3. Look what he says. Jesus answered And said to him, truly, truly. Now, I think you probably heard this before, but any time that there's the words truly, truly, you need to write it down. (laughs) You need to memorize it. You need to understand it. When Jesus makes a statement, truly, truly, he's about to give a principle. He's about to give a life principle that you're going to need. It's going to be something that you can bank on, will never change. That's what Jesus said to him. Truly, truly, I say to you. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you know what Jesus did? You know what he was doing there? Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, who has a lot of great qualities and who's being drawn by the Holy Spirit. But this is what he says to him. Nicodemus, you need to understand something. That you and I, we're on different planes. We're in different states of existence. We're not one rabbi talking to another rabbi. It's not going to be us talking about the meaning of Scripture And the truths of God's word. There's something unique about me that puts me on a totally different plane than where you are. Now Jesus is not saying that in an arrogant sense. Even though he had every privilege and opportunity to do that. Amen. (laughs) 
But Jesus is helping him to understand that Nicodemus, you're about to hear some things and you're about to be revealed to you some things that you will never expect because it's how to move from where you are to where I am. For see, Nicodemus, what I have come to do, I have come to usher in and to bring in the kingdom of God. That's, that's why I'm here. I've come to usher in the kingdom of God. In a more clear sense, he's come to win back, to redeem, to pay the price whereby man can have an opportunity to get back in on what he lost at the garden. I'm coming to enable you to have a relationship with a living God. That's why I'm here. And there's something distinctly different about me and you. And the only way that you can have that kingdom of God, the only way that that can be in your life, is you must be born again. We'll talk about that in more detail, but... To be born again means to be born from above. To be born from above. To have a spiritual birth. See, Nicodemus, I'm not coming here to teach new truths. I'm here to revolutionize life. I'm here to open the doors for you to experience and for mankind to experience that which they've never known before. But the way you get there is you're going to have to be born from above. Born from above. Next week we'll see what his question is. Nicodemus says, can you be born again? Can a man go into his mother's womb a second time? Isn't it funny that here's this great respected teacher who's one of the leading teachers, Pharisees, and leaders of the nation But he asked such a simple question, much like a child would ask, when Jesus says, you got to be born again. I'm glad he asked the question, because Jesus is going to help us to understand what it means to be born again. What do we gain from the passage today? That's what we gain. First of all, the only way that a person desires to know something about Jesus, to be attracted to see what Jesus did, to hear what Jesus says, to come to talk to Jesus about their life. The only way that happens is because they are drawn by and wooed by the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting? 6,000 Pharisees, but Nicodemus comes. 71 Sanhedrin, but Nicodemus comes. And the way that you come to Jesus and have a desire to be with Jesus is because you're drawn by Him. You're drawn by Him. And please listen to me. That is a privilege. That is an honor. That God would love you so much and care about you so much that He sends His Holy Spirit to draw you. It's not your mind. It's not your heart. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Our hearts run from God. Our hearts are selfish in ourselves. What is it that draws you to want to have that relationship with God? What draws you to want to talk to Jesus, to to know something more about life than what you know? It's because the Holy Spirit draws you. The Holy Spirit works in your heart and in your life. And that's what happened to Nicodemus. As he saw the signs and he heard the words... But Nicodemus had to do something. It wasn't enough that he's just drawn by the Holy Spirit. He makes a a very important decision that he's going to go see Jesus. He's going to go have a serious talk with Jesus. That he needs to have some answers from Jesus. And that is a step of faith. Listen, my friend, when the Holy Spirit is drawing you, when the Holy Spirit is moving on you, God is waiting for you to make a very important decision and that decision is to go see Jesus and to talk to Jesus that you want to have an encounter with Jesus he waits for you to make that decision 
That's your responsibility to come to talk to Jesus. Now, I want to tell you something. Whenever you talk to Jesus and you make that step of faith, Jesus is going to do just like he's going to do with Nicodemus. He's going to take you and he's going to help you to understand what it takes to be a part of the kingdom of God. He will reveal that to you. He will answer every question just like he does for Nicodemus. He's going to answer that question because the most important thing is for you and me to understand that we need the kingdom of God. That we need to be a part of the kingdom of God. See, it was not enough for Nicodemus to be religious. It's not enough for us to be religious, no matter what religion that is. It's not enough for Nicodemus to be a teacher. It wasn't enough for Nicodemus to be a member of the Sanhedrin, to be a ruler. What Nicodemus needed was to be born again, to be born from above, to have spiritual birth. And that's exactly the same with us. Do you hear those words? Unless one is born again, they will not see, they will not know, they will not experience the kingdom of God. you got to move from where you are to where Jesus is. you got to move from that earthly plane of being religious to being in the spiritual plane of being a part of the kingdom of God. And that happens because you come to Jesus and He helps you know how to be born again. He helps you know how to be a part of God's kingdom. And it all begins because He draws you. Boy, what's sad to me is that people can be drawn And they'll never go any step further than that. They can sit under a preacher's voice. They can hear a song be sung. They sit in a Sunday school class, hear a teacher on the radio. And and boy, something happens. They, They get drawn. There's something in their heart that says, you need something. You need something more. Just like it was in Nicodemus. You need something. You need something more. But so many people push that aside. And never go talk to Jesus. They never go ask Jesus. Jesus, tell me about it. Tell me what I need. Tell me how this can change my life. For if they would, they would be transformed. I'm so glad Nicodemus not only saw Jesus, heard Jesus, but came to Jesus. And gives Jesus a chance To tell him what he has to do in order to move from the plane he's on to the plane where Jesus is and wants Nicodemus to be. Now, you know the great thing about Nicodemus, you know the wonderful thing about him? Is at the end of the story we find out Nicodemus does believe. He does. In this chapter you never find out whether he believes or not. But the end of the story, whenever he's a part of of helping to bury Jesus, it, it lets us know that Nicodemus did believe it paid off that whenever he was drawn he came and talked to Jesus and what Jesus said got a hold of his heart and he moved from one plane to another listen if Jesus were here today he would tell you exactly the same thing you have got to be born from above it doesn't matter if you're the best that the world has to offer You're the best the world has to offer. The best the world has to offer is still on a different plane than being a part of the kingdom of God. Are you a part of that kingdom? Has the Holy Spirit drawn you, drawing you? Have you taken time to talk to Jesus? I hope you will. You need to. Jesus came to die so you could. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who is the one who draws us, who's the one who teaches us. Today, Lord, I thank you through this passage. We see, we see Nicodemus who comes and, and who's been drawn by the Holy Spirit and who comes to talk to Jesus. And, and Jesus gives him the answer he, He helps him to understand 
Nicodemus, there's got to be a transformation in your life. It's got to be just like being born physically. You're going to be born spiritually. And you're going to come to life in relationship to an eternal God in the kingdom of God. Thank you for Nicodemus coming. And Lord, I pray for us that every one of us would respond to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. And we would come and talk to Jesus and let Him show us and change us. For that person, Lord, who is in this congregation today, who's never given their heart to Christ, but even now they might sense that pulling, drawing, hunger for something new and something different in their life to fill that void spot of their life let them come let them respond we're here to receive you to pray with you to help you if you need Jesus as Lord and Savior he's drawing you come what about you child of God you rejoicing that he drew you Are you rejoicing that He showed you the way? Are you rejoicing that that you found out that no matter who you were and the best you had to offer, you still needed Jesus? You still need to be born again. You ought to rejoice in that today. Maybe you're here.